Dear Padma and Maxima and all the volunteers who have worked with you to make this gathering possible. Thank you so much for your labor of love. And that's something we have in infinite ability. Also to Nasama, thank you so much for introducing your lovely mother to us. <coughs> it is a problem with the violent system of capitalist patriarchy is we're born of mothers and we forget them and knock them out, including Mother Earth. And in fact, we are literally in the last century of this epic struggle between greed and violence and patriarchy and love and non-violence and the feminine. The feminine everywhere. So I think not to much confuse you about my bindi. I don't believe in decoration. I did not wear a bindi most of my life till I read a wonderful book on uh, the Sri Chakra, the symbol of the feminine power of the universe. And partly because we were colonized by the British, everything deep we do, like lighting the lamp and sowing the seed, was made to look like an empty ritual, a superstition. The Sri Chakra, the feminine power of the universe, at the end of the day, is a chakra. And like all mandalas, the beautiful mandala of the seed outside, uh, they are combinations of triangles and circles. That's what they are, triangles and circles. To so go back to class one of geometry, what is a triangle? Three lines. Enclosing a space. What's a line? A moving dot. What's a circle? A moving dot equidistant from a center. So what is the moving dot? The bindu, the bindi, which enfolds the universe. Just like that tiny little seed that we just sown there. It enfolds the future impermanence. I did my PhD on quantum theory. That's what quantum theory tells us. That in that little psi function is held the potential of a future unfolding in multiplicity. And the difference between a very patriarchal, industrial, mechanical thought and this living system is mechanical thought believes in fixed, separate, dead entities. But life is constantly evolving and renewing living systems. That's what permanence is. That's what permaculture is. That's what the culture and economy of permanence is. So when we sow a seed, we have a little prayer that says, may the seed be exhaustless. May it never run out. And when I started Navanya 30 years ago, and I would go into any home, largely homes of my sisters from the Chipko movement, and ask them for seed, and they'd give it so generously. And by the way, an interesting thing was, I, I'm trained in physics, I'm not trained in agriculture, but I started saving seed because corporations like Monsanto wanted to genetically modify and patent seed, and the only reason <coughs> they were pushing GF GMOs was for the patenting and the owning. And a patent is given for an invention. An invention is basically, usually, a machine, a new chemical molecule. Life is not a machine. Life is not invented. And the day I heard the corporation talk about spreading GMOs in order to collect royalties, uh, that's the day I decided I would save seeds. But also, Challenge the illusion, challenge the illusion that a GMO in effect is giving Monsanto license to say 
we are the creators of life on earth. So GMO means God move over. No creator, no creation. There's a Supreme Court judgment from the United States, Bauman versus Monsanto, where the judges actually said a seed is a self-replicating machine invented by Monsanto, and a farmer saving seed and planting seed is stealing the intellectual property of the self-replicating machine. It's this insanity that we have to challenge. So our seeds of permanence are the basis of any agriculture of permanence. And when we say may the seed be exhausted, we're basically saying may the potential of the seed to give us seed and not one seed to one seed. There's nothing that gives you one seed. You plant a seed, you might get hundreds, a thousand, the millets are called millets because of the million. That's where they get their name, the tiny, tiny, tiny grains. In one generation that can multiply million fold, in the next generation a million becomes million more, you eat some, you share some, you never run out. But since this idea of seed as the manufacture and intellectual property of the group of companies that I call the poison cartel, Since they came into the picture, we have seed famines. We have farmer suicides. This land is where the first suicide happened in Cotton, I remember, in Warangal, a young man. But I remember when Monsanto introduced the illegal trials of BT Cotton. In other places, farmers uprooted, but in a unified Andhra Pradesh at that time, it was the agriculture minister who went with the farmers to approve the illegal BT cotton. Now we were, we were first told a lie that this is Monsanto's invention. In India we worked to ensure our patent laws do not recognize the illusion of seed being an invention of the poison cartel. So our patent law has an article 3J which says plants, animals, and seeds, and their parts thereof are not invention and therefore cannot be patented. So Monsanto might have patents in the US, but it did not have patents in India. But it lied its way through, got every company of India to sign a license. No one else, no, they couldn't sell other seeds. And all the BT seeds were Monsanto. The ads used to say you'll never need to spray pesticides if it's going to control pests. The peat bollworm has knocked out three lakh hectares, I think, in, in this region, about four in Bidharba. And earlier farmers were dying because of death. They were committing suicide. It's cost three hundred thousand. Most of the suicides are in the cotton belt. 99% of the cotton seed is controlled by Monsanto. Every step illegal. The introduction illegal, the royalty collection illegal, the new roundup ready BT cotton illegal. And every time a regulatory agency takes action against them, all they do is sue the government. And so it ends up we, as citizens, have to come into courts and support our laws to ensure that our ethical framework of permanence is not knocked out. The pink bollworm has absolutely wiped out the cotton this year. So the only other application was herbicide tolerance. The super weeds have taken over agriculture wherever roundup resistant seeds were used because nature is intelligent. Bacteria evolve resistance to antibiotics. Weeds evolve resistance to Roundup. Pests evolve resistance to the BT toxin in the crop. So what's the next step they're thinking of? Are they thinking of stepping back because they made a scientific mistake and committed an ecocide and a genocide? No, they want to rush further. So the solution to herbicide-resistant weeds 
in the United States is a new program of violence, an absolutely unacceptable program of violence, which is exterminating species through the new technology of gene drugs. There's a new report out from the Defense Research Agency and the Gates Foundation who was visiting Andhra Pradesh. I worry when I see this picture with the chief minister in India. Because he's trying to continue what Monsanto is failing at. He's trying to continue the golden rice. He's trying to continue the BT egg plant which grew out of India and they took it to Bangladesh. And he's trying to continue a failed industrial farming based on only one thing, poison. The poison cartel, which is now merging again, they were one in the time of Hitler, IG Farben, Standard Oil. Monsanto is merging with Bayer, Dow is merging with DuPont, Syngenta is merging with Saint China. Three giants. What is their expertise? Killing. Their expertise was killing humans in the beginning, in the concentration camps, and in the world, the poison gases. These are the precursors of every pesticide that we use. Even the chemical fertilizers, the natural fertilizers, came from the ammunition factories and explosive factories. It's the same process of burning fossil fuel at 550 degrees to fix atmospheric nitrogen. I'm holding a little tool bar. It can do a much better job of fixing nitrogen non-violently in the soil. Give us 200 kilograms of nitrogen. All the summer, and not only they give us good nitrogen in the soil, Albert Howard, who wrote the book Agricultural Testament, has a lovely uh, farrer saying while the West, Western scientific community was still debating about whether or not plants can fix nitrogen, Indian farmers had this intelligence and were using nitrogen fixing crops in mixtures to create products. So not only do we get free, nitrogen in the soil, we get good healthy protein. Are any of you from Canada? So there's a new disease of free trade that is dumping a pathetic yellow pea dal on India as a fake substitute for thun. Thun has 30 grams of uh, protein. The yellow pea has seven. Uh, grams and uh, uh, I, no, it's, it's a percentage. The percentage of protein is seven percent to twenty percent, and it's tasteless. It's sprayed with Roundup, and it's being dumped on India through what I call unfair trade treaties. That's why I think this issue of fair share is so important. Because you can only get a fair share in a fair economy. And in a fair economy, a producer of food should be able to have 50% of what is the final value of food. In the unfair economy, producers are getting 1%. I've done studies on the potato, I've done studies on other commodity crops, 1%, and a debt to top it off. Potato farmers growing Pepsi potatoes in Bengal are now committing suicide. They get 1% of that horrible packet of lace chips, <laughs> where the tribals have also paid with their lives for the bauxite mining. But Pepsi has them in debt because Pepsi owns the potato seed, the chemical fertilizers and pesticides are part of the profit system. So not only is an agriculture based on poison killing our farmers, it's killing life on earth. All the data now is clear and I have a book on who really feeds the world. It was written for uh, the Milan Expo on feeding the world. 75% of the soil destruction, degradation, desertification is because of the industrial model of farming, including the Syria problem of refugees 
including Boko Haram in Nigeria, including migration everywhere. Most refugees are refugees of an industrial agriculture. 75% water destruction, 93% vegetable plants, biodiversity. Our studies on the BP cotton area are showing 60% disappearance of soil organisms. 60%. Pollinators, 75% gone. They just did a German study, 75% insects have disappeared in the last decade. 75% insects. And without this biodiversity, we don't have life on Earth and we don't have food. But as I wrote in my book, Soil Not Oil, 50% of all greenhouse gases that are contributing to climate change come from the industrial globalized model of farming. And now we have a new book out called Unknown Food as Health, 75% chronic diseases, which are called lifestyle diseases, but are food style diseases, and are industrial food system diseases, 75%. You add it all up, our assessment is just for social and environmental damage in India, the externality is 1.2 trillion annually. At the health cost, it's another 1.3 trillion. So about $3 trillion annually is a burden the earth is bearing and people are bearing for the super profits of the poison public. But we have alternate. That's what we're here, to celebrate. And while we celebrate alternatives, we have to stop the next stage of insanity. The next stage of insanity for Monsanto is farming without farmers. We don't need people. They actually talk farming without farmers. Farming with surveillance drones, spyware in your tractor, digital speculation to take patterns, Two algorithms, they call it artificial intelligence. There's nothing artificial about intelligence. Intelligence is intelligence that allows you to live. Machine intelligence allows you to process an algorithm. An algorithm is not life. The seed has much more intelligence than the Sophia that got citizenship in Saudi Arabia, which doesn't give its women citizenship and doesn't give its migrant labor citizenship. And just like while people are losing their human rights, corporations are becoming persons with the highest rights. While people are losing their citizenship, robots are being given citizenship to make us believe that the machines we create are taking over. There's no way they can take over the care of the earth and the care of people. It's only loving, intelligent people who can do it with other intelligent beings. And this is the future we have to work for, the future on which we should build, and all the contributions of everyone who went before us. I remember in 91, I did a Schumacher lecture with Bill Mollison, and everyone was very annoyed with Bill because they came to listen about permaculture, he, all he talked about was the financial economy. And we should have listened to him because we have reached the situation where six years ago, 388 men controlled half the wealth of the world. Three years ago, it dropped to 62. Last year, it was eight. This year, it dropped to five men controlling half the wealth of the world. And on this rate of reduction in the number of billionaires, we are going to have one soon. Already Jeff Bezos, who stole retail, first publishing now retail, and Bill Gates are in the competition. But none of them have created anything. Not one, not, Bill Gates did not create the software that runs Microsoft. I won't go into details on that. Basics was run by Dartmouth College, professors of math. MS-DOS was a software developer. And just like in software, the enclosure of the commons is the way patented software evolved, 
the inclusion of the seed farmers is what all of them are seeking. And Bill Gates has a very, very big hand now in patenting life. My new book is about all of this. Our time is to remember we are Earth citizens. Our time is to remember that working with other species and other beings, the soil organisms, the insects, the biodiversity of plants, we produce more food. So all of the measurements in agriculture about these are about commodity production. They are not about food and nutrition production. So every time they say we feed the world, they basically are saying we feed our profits. Four crops account for most grain traded. 90% of the corn and soya is being used for biofuel and animal feed. It is not in the food system. So it's not an accident that we have growing hunger and growing malnutrition. It's not an accident that the three deep crises we face are all related to industrial farming. The planetary crisis of species extinction and, bio and um, climate change, the production crisis of farmers dying in very, very large numbers, or disappearing from the land. The land has become the single biggest speculative commodity. And you just come from Cyberabad, which I see as a burial of farmland. I see it as an enclosure of the tank system, which is what made this amazing city. And I look ahead 100 years from now. Will this edifice be here? They're already saying bye bye to all the IT professionals. Hey, your work, your work was done work. It can be done by computers. All of this structure will not last a hundred years. And every scientific prediction is, if we continue on the path of destruction, within a hundred years, our species will be extinct like we have pushed so many others to extinction. Thousand times the normal rate is the biodiversity extinction. People are talking about the six mass extinction. And if you push and say, okay, what is driving it? On farm, chemical farming, off farm chemical farming. We don't need to grow palm oil by chopping down the rainforest. We don't need to grow GM soya in the Amazon or in the Argentinian forests and the savannas. We have destroyed the health of the planet and our health. So this industrial system is only producing 30% of the food we eat while using 70% of the resources. If it increases to 45%, we're gonna have a very dead planet because it has destroyed 75%. You don't have food on a dead planet, you don't have life on a dead planet. We have to now continue the work of a permanent agriculture, by rejuvenating our soil, by rejuvenating our biodiversity, by rejuvenating our water, by rejuvenating the climate balance, which requires the capacity of the earth to reabsorb the emissions. And therefore, the emissions can't be beyond the rate at which that absorption capacity is. We've got to heal the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle, and there's only one path to it, ecological farming. The industrial farming is not just a source of emissions through fossil fuels, but the nitrous oxides, which are 300 times more damaging for climate balance. And then the methane. 600 million years of work the Earth did to put all of this fossilized organic matter underground. And I think by putting it underground, you were saying leave it there. But Bill Gates and friends have created a whole new language. He did it in Paris, and that's when I woke up. He started to use the word decarbonize. Now, 
you know, the plants are carbon, the seeds we plant with our carbon, we are carbon, organic farming is carbon, permaculture is carbon, we grow living carbon. Living carbon is the basis of life. Dead carbon underground is what should be left underground. What's happening is by using climate change, they're confusing our minds and criminalizing carbon even in the living form. And I know this because the poor farmers of Punjab have been hounded. We make lovely organic gur from organic sugarcane. Gur is just the concentrated sugarcane juice. The ancient sugar making of India, gur shakkar buddha. The word sugar comes from shakkar. The area in the Ganges basin between the Yamuna and Ganga is where sugarcane was domesticated. So, you know, you crush the sugarcane, you have the bagas, you burn it to boil the sugarcane juice. They're hounding our units to say you can't burn the bagas. Decarbonize. But decarbonize, living carbon is death. That is the agriculture they would like. Glyphosate, not plants. I remember in a big debate in the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Monsanto representative actually got up. You know, in those days, I was the one talking about genetically engineered crops. And this guy gets up and says, oh, we make such a smart uh, innovation. Uh, the herbicide resistant Roundup Ready crop. He said, we prevent the weeds from stealing the sunshine. When did the sun have scarcity? The sun shines not just on us today and on all beings, but has done it forever and will continue to do it forever. Bill Gates is also financing other stupid ideas. Block the sun to pollution. It's all geoengineering. Artificial volcanoes. Reflectors in the sky as if the sun was the problem. The sun is a blessing. Without it, we wouldn't have photosynthesis. We wouldn't have plants. We wouldn't have food. We wouldn't have life. So, you know, I, I got a message. Bill Gates is meeting the UP chief minister. So I said, there's any more a class. So I did a permaculture farm of Aranya or the Navanya farm in Dehradun to learn the ABC of life. He needs a lot of ecological literacy. He might be the richest man in the world, but in ecological terms, he is absolutely illiterate. And that's why putting the future of humanity in the hands of emotionally illiterate, ecologically illiterate, nutritionally, he eats a hamburger. All the time he eats a hamburger. He should come and eat a Dadi roti. So our work has shown that with intensification of biodiversity, just saving the seeds, growing biodiversity intensely, that's living carbon, we actually provide much more nutrition per acre. We call it health per acre. And we could feed through permaculture, ecological farming, organic farming, we could feed two Indias and two times the world population while taking care of the planet, while rejuvenating the soil, why reversing climate change? Why reversing desertification? So in Dune Valley, where we have 2,000 members, we just did a 20-year study. Our organic matter has gone up 99%. It's gone down in the chemical farms by 14%. Our nitrogen, without applying urea, has gone up 21%. It's gone down 22% on the chemical farms. We are losing nitrogen in the soil by applying synthetic nitrogen. But all the micronutrients that are such a major issue. I had a visitor from, um, from Australia who said, uh, who she, she saw our data and she said, you know, Australian teenagers are all going into depression because they have zinc deficiency. And in England, magnesium deficiency was identified as the attention deficit disorder, driving violence. So zinc has gone up on the organic farm 14% gone down 37% in the chemical farm. Magnesium has gone up 14% on our farm, 70% decrease. The whole micronutrient deficiency epidemic is a result of a poison farm, a chemical farm. 
And of course, you're ready with their golden rice. You're ready with the few pathetic applications that keep failing. Since 2000, they are trying to do golden rice. You're from Philippines. The farmers protested. So they fly, Bill Gates flies uh, Mark Linus in to say, no, 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 these weren't farmers because they wear shorts. Well, Philippine farmers will say they're shorts. They won't wear dhotis and lungis like we do in India. Even on water and desertification, which is such a big issue in central India now. I know definitely for Andhra, for Vidarbha, water scarcity. But our data is showing that with 0.5% organic matter, we can hold 80,000 liters of water in the soil. This is the answer to desertification and water scarcity. With 5% organic matter, 800,000 liters, the soil is the biggest reservoir on the earth. And we forgot its soil fertility. We forgot its water holding capacity. In all the chemical textbooks, it says the soil is an empty container to pour nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium into it. The plant is a machine run on the fuel of chemical fertilizer. The other day I was teaching children in Delhi, and I asked, I said, what is food? Because they're trying to get them off junk food. I said, what is food? You know, 25% kids of Delhi are obese because of the junk food diet. And this kid says, it's fuel for running the, our body, which is a machine, which is what the school book says. Food is fuel for running this machine. Now, this machine is super intelligent at every level. Nearly 100 trillion cells in our gut microbiome. So much neuro science activity going on there, they call the gut the second brain now. That second brain is smarter than the, the brain of a consumer who is being driven to ruin their health with some chemically contaminated, industrially processed junk food. So our intelligence now is really a challenge of how do we move into the future beyond extinction? That extinction is not inevitable. Growing permanent agriculture, growing permanent economy, is something we have the capacity to do. Just like this bindi enfolds the future, we as practitioners of permanence enfold the future. And in the process, we don't just create a healthy planet to offer healthy people to people care, but justice and fairness so that there is a return to the earth, there is a return to the farmer, there's a return to community. An extractive economy that is led leaving five men with half the wealth of the world is not sustainable. It is not sustainable. It is anyway unjust. It is anyway dishonest. It is anyway based on theft and on cheating. So if we not need truth and honesty and fairness in our communities and in our lives, we begin with the food we eat. We begin with our lives. It's not given to us to try to address the planetary level beginning with the planetary level. We address the planetary level beginning with the local. And because the world is connected, every time we sow a seed, we are growing the future. Every time we protect the soil, we are growing the future. Every time we take living carbon and allow the excess carbon dioxide to be reabsorbed from the air, we are addressing climate change, not by looking at how many parts per billion, million is in the air, but looking at how Earth care can address the reduction of the parts per million and the reduction of emissions. In any way, uh, you know, Trump has said, I'm not obeying the agreement. We have 
rogue corporations and we have rogue leaders. And in the context of rogue corporations and rogue leaders, we have to be even more active. We have to do even more of our bit. And learning from the seed, I have never underestimated smallness. The big problems of our times will be addressed to millions of us acting at the small level where we are. And just like you have all gathered here and created this convergence, that convergence is the amplification of power, of energy. I invite you next year for a biodiversity convergence. We're doing a very big biodiversity congress in Dehradun. But before that, we will do a women's gathering because long ago I started a movement called Diverse Women for Diversity to basically tell the crazy, you say, no, 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 you're not inventors, sorry. We're going to save the seeds and we will defend the freedom of the seed to evolve. At WTO, sorry, free trade is not destroying farms and our health. Free trade is working according to the laws of the earth and the laws of our humanity. We live on one planet as one humanity in all our diversity. And then after the Congress, we have another agroecological gathering. You can look out for all of this on the Navania website. Nasima comes every year when we do the one month training on the A to Z of agroecology, organic food systems, and biodiversity. And it's by working together that our part is much more than our individual part. Our power is the power of the millions and trillions of species on this earth. Our power is the power of every marginalized and forgotten person. Our power is the power of life, which will not be extinguished, no matter how deep the urge for extermination be, in those who have only money-making in their minds, who are only driven by greed and by violence. Because in my life experience and in my philosophy, love and nonviolence have always been more powerful to save systems based on violence and peace. Thank you.